Well, hey, welcome uh, back this morning. Uh, happy to be back together again, even in the uh, online uh, venue here. And uh, today's a significant day. Uh, we're excited today, uh, this morning, June 21st, to say Happy Father's Day. And uh, could think of no better present than for many of our dads to invite them back to church this morning. And so we are open this morning and uh, have moved into our new uh, Being Back at Church Together format. Uh, offering services at 8 and 9.30 and 11 a.m. on Sundays, and that's the plan for the foreseeable future. Uh, we've been working hard the last few weeks to understand and to comply with uh, the things that the government's asked us to do and uh, have worked through all the forms and all the um, health and safety concerns, and I'm very thankful for our uh, reopening task force that's worked through the logistics of that uh, to make sure that people are screened and safe while we're here and socially distanced and all those things that we're uh, adjusting to as Americans in 2020. But uh, also want to continue in this format and want to continue to provide opportunity for those of you that are, are unable to make it back for whatever reason that may be here in the short run. We appreciate that a number of you are dealing with various health issues or issues within your family that uh, make this necessary and appropriate. And uh, so we want to take care of you also. And so this may be the last day that we do it in this format of a pre-recorded uh, message. Our hope is that by next week we'll actually be able to record what's going on in service for you uh, to be able to watch at home uh, on Sunday mornings, um, at least with a little bit of delay from when it's recorded in service. But I uh, want to continue to make that option available for as long as is necessary as we move forward here together. So um, if you turn with me this morning, we're going to look at uh, the book of Romans, chapter 14 and chapter 15. I've um, just been uh, amazed these last few months at just how much is changing around us and how swiftly culture is moving. I know to a certain extent that's always true, uh, but certainly has been very evident here the last couple of months. And in a, in a sobering way, uh, it's been sad to see our culture just begin to eat itself alive and to see people um, with great disunity attacking each other and uh, trying to work through all the stresses, certainly, of being um, home and being wrapped up in our own little worlds in a, a way different than normal. Uh, but recognize that that um, is going to be a particular challenge for us as a church as we come back together. And so I thought appropriate today, um, in the excitement of us being back together, as we begin to wrestle through how to think through these last few months and how that applies as we come back together, to spend some time uh, reminding ourselves of what we're called to in the book of Romans in terms of loving one another and moving towards each other in unity. Uh, I think in a unique way, our church has been challenged, and there's so much opportunity to be divisive in these times. Uh, when we um, have been isolated for so long, uh, I was pondering this week and just reflecting on Genesis 2 and the fact that uh, Adam very quickly realized when he was alone in the garden with all the animals and doing the work that God had laid out for him that it was not good for him to be alone. And God identified this and therefore provided him with a spouse, um, with a wife to enjoy because we as human beings are made for relationship. We're made to engage with one another. And so one of the challenges of these past few months is we've been alone. Uh, we have been holed up and isolated from one another. We have not uh, been able to engage with other human beings in the ways that we normally would. And that feeds into our self-centeredness, into our selfishness, into uh, the echo chamber of our own lives where we haven't had the opportunities to listen to others. We haven't had the opportunity as we normally would to gather and have others, Christians and mature believers, speak into our lives in the way that we had before. In light of all that's going around, on around us in culture and um, as we try to move back now into relationship with one another and, and into communion with one another as we gather on a more regular basis, we also recognize um, just how much tension can be created in these moments. And I think Romans 14 speaks to that issue. Um, certainly Romans 13, which has talked about submission to government, has applied. And we've talked about that a lot over the last couple of months as we work hard to be submissive to our government, even when we disagree with some of the regulations that are being put in place. But Romans 14 um, addresses how we engage with one another in areas that aren't so black and white, in areas that aren't clear cut um, in the commands of Scripture. Scripture. 
Those things which two believers might look at and might decide differently on what the appropriate course of action is for themselves or for their family. When uh, Becca and I got married in 2004, we stepped on to college staff here at the church and spent 12 years uh, ministering in and among our college students. And as you can imagine, uh, these type of um, Christian liberty topics, those gray areas in the Christian life that Romans 14 addresses were a a common um, topic of conversation. As our young people worked through, what's it mean to play out the principles of the Christian life? What's it mean to seek to honor God in the variety of um, circumstances of life that I'm experiencing? How do I work through that? And I thought, uh, just for fun, um, I'd recap a few of these uh, topics that came up during those times. There's, of course, the um, very common college age questions of, is it okay to drink alcohol or to smoke a cigar? Or can we go out dancing together? Can I wear a bikini to the beach? And am I allowed to get a tattoo as a Christian? We ask the questions of, is it okay to clap or to raise my hands in church? Is it okay to ever watch an R-rated movie or just waste time watching a television show that I enjoy? Is it okay to date when I was in high school? Or would it be okay to date this unbeliever that I know? Can I wear shorts to church? Can I drive one mile an hour over the speed limit that's posted on the road? Do I have to vote when I'm given the opportunity to do that? Can I spend money on things that I want if I'm being God's steward of his resources? Would it ever be okay to curse or to swear? And what do I do with my homosexual friends that are getting married and want me to be in their wedding or to at- even to attend? How do I handle those things? And certainly some of those are easier to answer than others. Uh, some of them are more straightforward and the path of wisdom and discernment um, and answering those questions is clearer than not. But every single one of those situations was something that came up with our college students that other adults in our church disagreed with the way that somebody was proceeding. They're all areas that good Christians, mature believers could look at and say, I have the freedom in Christ to do this or to not do this. And so how do we reconcile those things? Over the past couple of months, we've had a whole new wave of questions in this genre that haven't come up before. Things like, should I wear a mask to the grocery store? Should I hug someone that comes up to me in public that isn't part of my household? Are we allowed to invite people over to our house for for dinner when everything is shut down? There's protests of our government going on. Should we participate in that? Should we engage in a Black Lives Matter march? What do we do in these situations and how do we work through and how do we answer those things is the topic that Romans 14 talks about. And I think it's important for us to remember that Christianity is not a list of rules. It's part of what makes gathering as a church right now so difficult because we're not just checking the box of church attendance on a Sunday morning. We actually want to come together in community, and that level of coming together in community is still being restricted by the government right now. And so we engage to the extent that we are able and to the extent that we are allowed and we long for more opportunity for relationship with one another. As we begin to gather and as we start to work through situations and circumstances where these brothers and sisters in Christ that are part of our church are gathering with us and we disagree on some of these questions. We disagree on how to come together. We disagree on what decisions we're going to make about how we conduct ourselves with one another. We want to look at what Romans 14 says, and really just three principles I want to give you today, and we're going to cover this uh, broadly and in general, not in incredible detail, but I want to give a a broad brushstroke of our um, requirements and our opportunities as believers as we engage in the area of Christian liberty. The first principle is this. It's in the first half of Romans 14. The first 12 verses speak to the fact that we are free in Christ, and so we are to glorify God. If you look at verse 1 of Romans 14, it says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, not to quarrel over opinions. We are uh, see here, as Paul begins this discourse in chapter 14, verse 1, that he identifies the one that is weak in faith. There will be a contrast in this chapter between those that are weak in faith and those that are strong in faith. As he continues with his argument, he's going to explain that we all should be strong in faith. 
that in Christ, we all have the freedom to engage in a wide variety of things. We shouldn't be bound by overly restrictive um, rules and regulations, that in Christ we are free, that so many things are not bound by any kind of command of God. Now, certainly, there are things which are bound by commands of God. And so this chapter is not dealing with things that are clearly sinful. Things that are clearly sinful, we need to respond in obedience and in submission to the word of God and what he's told us to do. That is Romans 13, that we're to submit to government. And so we happily do that unless they ask us to violate some other command that God has given. We want to be submissive. That's not a matter of debate or a matter that Romans 14 is addressing in terms of a gray area in the Christian life. But there are many things, like the other things that we discussed, that are open for some debate and are open for differing of opinions between these things. And there are some brothers in Christ who understand that freedom, the freedom that we have to engage in all things in this category without condemnation. But there's also the weaker brother who doesn't yet feel or has not yet matured into that freedom in Christ, that feels restrained, that for their own uh, case or their own situation are going to be more cautious and how they move forward. And oftentimes this is good. Oftentimes they are not yet ready to take on more than that. And we shouldn't be pushed beyond where our conscience uh, leads us to go. And, and Paul will talk about that. But as we work through and as we understand, this is the one that he's referring to as being weak in faith. The one who is yet to mature into that full understanding of the freedom that we have in Christ to engage in this way. And so in verse 1, Paul addresses this, saying, As for the one who is weak in faith, those who are strong in faith then, those who are not weak in faith, are to welcome him. That's our responsibility. For those of us that are mature in Christ, for those of us that understand the freedom that we have in Christ, we have a responsibility to welcome, not to shun or to push away our brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling in particular areas and feeling the freedom to do the things that we do on our, as we make our own decisions. And he goes a step further by saying, not only are we to welcome the one who is weak in faith, but we're to do that, he says at the end of verse 1, not to quarrel over opinions. Our purpose in welcoming the weak brother in Christ back is not so we can argue the point and we can make our case of why we're right and they're wrong. The Lord's bondservant, Paul says in 1 Timothy, is not to be quarrelsome. He's to be kind to all, patient with wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. We don't welcome our weak brothers in Christ back so that we can prove that we are right. We simply welcome our brothers and sisters in Christ back, even when they're struggling with a weakness of faith in these areas. Well, Paul goes on here is to encourage us that we each need to wrestle through making our own decisions in these areas. Uh, verses 2 and 3 identify a particular example of meat that was sacrificed to idols. And I don't want to take the time to unpack all of that for us here this morning, other than to say this was an issue where Christians took both sides of the issues, where some said it was okay to eat meat sacrificed to other idols, and others said that it was not okay. And neither was right or wrong. It was an issue of stronger and weaker faith. And so in a similar way then, Paul encourages them as they worked through that topic and as we work through the issues that are relevant to us today, each one of us needs to come to a conclusion, to a decision point in our own lives, asking the question, how do I honor God in this situation? I think actually that's a, a great question for us to ask in a more regular way in our lives. How do we honor the Lord in the situation that he has me in right now? I think of 1 Thessalonians 5, which talks about the fact that we're to pray without ceasing. Maybe one of the ways that we should do that is as we go through our day and as we encounter new decision points and new circumstances, to be constantly intercessing before the Lord and asking the question of, how do I honor you, Lord, in this situation, in this circumstance? And Paul's saying that we should be convinced of that in our own mind. We need to be convinced this is how I'm going to honor God in this situation. And the beauty of this passage is that we each have the freedom to do that in the way that we see fit. And we may then, as believers, arrive at different conclusions about what the best way to honor God is in a particular situation. And we have the freedom to do that. 
Paul then says to make your own decision and don't do it to pass judgment or to despise someone who makes a different decision than you. Look at verse 3 saying, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. It is not our place to make that call for somebody else. And Paul begins to work through why in verses 4 and 5 and 6. And I appreciate this. And the reason why is this. Look at Romans 14, 4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make him stand. And again, he uses another example of days in verses 5 and 6 and says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. More important then the, the, the decision that we make and the place that we land is that our intent is to honor the Lord in the decision that we're making. We like in our family, uh, a common question that's come up the last year um, has been to say to our children, who are you responsible for? Uh, we have a seven and a half year old daughter, Kay, and a son, Ben, who turns four uh, tomorrow, and wouldn't you know, seven and a half year olds and almost four year olds have very strong opinions and like to be bossy when it comes to telling the other one what to do. And so our response in those situations is to say, who are you responsible for? Who are you responsible for? And the answer, of course, is I'm responsible for me, right? Stay out of your sibling's business. Stay out of trying to manage their situation. Your job is to make sure you're doing what you've been told to do. And in the same way as believers, our job is to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do, that make sure that we're asking the questions of how do I honor the Lord in this situation? And if you're doing that, let other people also go through that same process on their own. It's not your responsibility to deal with that. This is what Paul identifies here, that, that actually it is the right question to ask of, am I honoring God in my situation? Usually in our kids' lives, the reality is, is that they're not doing the job obeying they're supposed to be doing and are busy trying to get their sibling to obey. So often that's true of us also. Are we doing the best job we can to honor the Lord in the situation, or have we been distracted by other things? as our focus shifted off of making sure we're being obedient and we're honoring the Lord and on to trying to manage everybody else's lives for them. I appreciate what Paul says in, in Romans 14 then in verse 7, that none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And what's Paul saying? Well, quite simply, he's saying that life is not about you. Whether you live or whether you die, it is for the Lord. It's your responsibility then to ask the question, is what I'm doing for the Lord, is it honoring to him? Am I making sure to evaluate my actions and my decisions to ensure that I'm doing it not for my own personal gain or for my own personal pleasure, but to honor the Lord in all things and to ensure that my life conforms to that expectation? as we start to engage in other people's lives and as we start to pass judgment on the things that they're deciding as they seek to honor the Lord, we are out of our lane, we're out of our, our role that we should be playing in one another's lives. They're the Lord's servants. Before the Lord, they're going to stand or they're going to fall, they're going to have to give an account to the Lord for their actions. I don't have to give an account for your actions. You don't have to give an account in that way for my actions. Now, again, I, I think appropriate to note that we are talking about um, situations that aren't clearly sinful or aren't clearly commanded in Scripture. Certainly, we have an obligation to engage with one another and to encourage and to spur one another on to do the things that are right. We have a responsibility to encourage one another to make sure that we're asking the questions of are we seeking to honor the Lord in our actions but within the freedom that we have in Christ, because we do have freedom in Christ, we don't have the responsibility to micromanage somebody else's decisions as they seek to honor the Lord in their life. And so the end of this first section simply is this understanding that 
we are free in Christ. We are free to honor the Lord. We have the the freedom to engage in a wide variety of things so that we would take advantage and that we would leverage those situations to be able to see the gospel going forward in a variety of circumstances and situations. You are free, but the purpose of that freedom is not that we would satisfy ourselves, but it's that we would seek to glorify God in the things that we're pursuing. Well, Paul continues on here in chapter 14, and in the second section, 13 down to 23, as the chapter closes, Paul also identifies then that while we are free and while we have the freedom to pursue a variety of things in order to glorify Christ, that freedom is also bound by a requirement to consider others. Look at how he transitions in verse 13. Paul says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, Right? Don't sit in judgment on the decision another person has made, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. It's not enough to simply declare, I have the right in Christ to do this thing, and that's fine. I'm going to do what I want to do. You do what you want to do. I don't care. But actually, we have more responsibility than that. The end of the verse says we actually need to consider the decisions that we're making. We need to consider the freedom that we have in Christ and ensure that our freedom in Christ and our exercising of that freedom doesn't create a stumbling block for a brother or for a sister in Christ. Our freedom shouldn't be a hindrance to someone else's salvation or sanctification. In fact, Paul says in verse 14, just so we're clear on where he stands on this issue, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Paul wants to to firmly cement himself in the stronger brother camp. He has the freedom in Christ to engage in all kinds of things. I think this uh, parallels really closely to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we're, so, we're told that we're tempted um, by our desires. And when those desires are conceived, they give birth to sin. In other words, it is not temptation itself or even our desires that is sinful. It's when in that moment between our desires being tempted, when we yield to those desires, that sin is conceived. This gives us the freedom then to understand that we can engage in a variety of different ways without sinning, that we can participate in a variety of different things without sinning. And yet we have to recognize in that because of the differences in in how we were brought up and how we're raised in our own strengths and weaknesses and gifting before the Lord and even our spiritual maturity and where we're at on a particular issue in terms of being the stronger or the weaker brother, that we won't all engage in those things in the same way. And so because of that, then, we're reminded here that we are required to consider others when exercising our freedom in Christ. Just because it's okay for me to engage in something doesn't mean it's going to be okay for you to engage in that thing, and vice versa. Verse 15 says, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. We need to remember that as we pursue our freedom in Christ and as we use that um, to see the gospel going forward and to enjoy the world that God has created, that we're careful not to cause a brother in Christ to stumble, that we're careful in the exercising of our freedom, that we're not causing a sin issue in the life of another person, not because the thing itself is wrong, but because their ability to handle that and deal with that at this point in time isn't fully matured to the point it would be. We have a responsibility to care for them. We have a responsibility to do more than just say, it's their problem, I have the right to do this thing. To adapt that sort of attitude is actually the antithesis of what Christ did. We're told in Philippians 2 that Christ gave up everything. He gave up all his rights, all his privileges to come to this earth so that we might be moved towards God, that we might be saved. When we head down the pathway that says, doesn't matter what they think, that's their problem. We're standing between that person and their relationship with their Lord and their ability to move towards Christ. We're becoming a stumbling block to them. So we need to be really thoughtful and really careful and recognizing as we have the freedom to apply our our liberty in Christ in a variety of ways that we're thoughtful about the weaker brothers that God has placed around us. 
This is what Paul reminds us in the rest of the chapters. He says in verse 17 that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That's our responsibility, that we would pursue what makes for peace, what makes for edifying or building up the body of Christ, not for tearing it down, not for uh, using it to satisfy our own pleasures and desires. Our freedom exists to further the cause of Christ in the lives of others, not to merely satisfy our own desires. Well, as we move into uh, Romans 15, I just wanted to quickly touch on the, the opening seven verses that Danny read for us today, because if that's not enough of an encouragement, enough of a reminder, I think Paul really puts the capstone on it here. And the third principle, not just that we're free in Christ and therefore ought to glorify him, not just as we express our freedom in Christ, we have a re responsibility to care for the people around us. But also, while we're free in Christ, we're responsible to actually move towards one another in unity. Look at what he says in verse 1. We then who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. There, there's the, the summary of 14 for you. All of chapter 14, right? We have a responsibility. We need to be convinced that our role in the areas where we feel like, hey, this is no big deal. I have the rights to do this. I'm free in Christ to do this. That we would understand that we actually have an obligation, Paul says, to bear with those that feel differently. That we would bear with them. That we would welcome them, he said in 14.1. Not to win the argument, not to convince them that they believe something wrong, but actually to come alongside them, to bear with them, to hold them up. And that may require, that often will require my willingness to give up what I want and what I feel like I have the right or am entitled to. He goes on just to encourage us in that, to remember that Christ is our example in this. Verse 3 of chapter 15 says that Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. We need to remember that Christ is our perfect example, that he was willing to give these things up, that Christ was willing to not please himself, but to care for us. And so the end result of that and what we're encouraged and the way um, we're challenged to follow in Christ's example is what Paul says in Romans 5, or 15, 5 to 7. He says, may the God of endurance and encouragement, right? Endurance, we need endurance right now, and we need encouragement too. May he grant you to live in such harmony with one another, live in harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. As we come together and as we engage and as we encounter, certainly encounter those among us and those in the community that think differently than we do about certain things, we need to ask ourselves if we're seeking to glorify God in a particular situation. And, and when we pursue that pathway, we need to recognize we have a responsibility to care for those around us and to move towards them and to pursue unity with them. Unity in the body of Christ doesn't just happen. It happens when we're willing to die to self, when we're willing to give up our rights and privileges, even when they're guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution, for the sake of the weaker brother and sister in Christ that's struggling and having a hard time. We bear up under that burden with them. We challenge them and we encourage them to seek to glorify God in the things that we're doing. And as we're willing to do this and to die to self, the body of Christ is built up. It's brought together in unity. And so we want that. We want to work hard here this summer as we come back together to love one another. We want to work hard to be good examples of what submission and obedience to government looks like and what it looks like to be a mature believer who's willing to die to self to care for those that God has placed in our family here. So we love you guys. I hope you have the opportunity here in the coming weeks to join us at church on Sunday mornings. We're working hard uh, to be compliant in the things that we need to to keep things safe and healthy and secure um, for those that are dealing with various issues that way. Um, but do look forward to the opportunity to do the things that God has called us to um, and actually loving and, and preferring one another as we engage that way. We hope you're doing well. Please do contact us if you need anything. But otherwise, we look forward to seeing you again here shortly. Let me pray for us as we close today.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the gift of your Son. We thank you for Jesus Christ and just the tremendous example that he is for us in a wide, wide range of areas. Certainly in the matter of rights, um, he is our example. There is no greater sacrifice that was made in terms of giving up one's rights and privileges and freedoms than the one that was made by Christ to give up his position with you in heaven, to give up his place beside you, to empty himself, to become a man that we might be moved towards you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, allow us to see our own sinfulness, that you would allow us to see our own uh, frustrations and selfishness and pride and just um, to be willing to die to self on those things, to be willing to let your gospel do its work in our life, to labor, um, to consider others as more important than ourselves, to be willing to do the uncomfortable things that we don't necessarily agree with if it means caring for the person around us. And as then we do that, and as we pursue one another in gentleness and with compassion and empathy, Lord, that you would give us opportunities empowered by your spirit to speak the truth into one another's lives. Because, Lord, we don't want to stay as the weaker brothers. We want to continue to be um, moved towards you in sanctification, to be refined, to become more and more like your son, and to be strong and strengthened in our faith. Pray that we would be diligent uh, to do those things, and that we would be a place where you are honored and exalted, where your word is proclaimed, and where your people love one another. In your name we pray. Amen.